Welcome everyone to another episode of the Old Timers Comic Book Show. I am your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes, and it's Happy New Year. Ignore the sign, it's not 1984 anymore. Well, it's Old Timers, so you never can tell. Uh, joining me for this episode, as always, are two of my favourite Old Timer colleagues. We have the Professor and the 13th Crusader. How's hey. it going, guys? Hola. Hey, Johnny. Hey, Mike. How are you? Doing all right. All right. Everyone have a good Christmas. We did. Yeah, it was quiet. Yeah. yeah quiet. Socially I... distant. <laughs> yes. Anybody get any cool stuff? Uh, hold on. I'll show you. I got a little thing from my sister-in-law. I just got it today. Actually, it's like a little, it's a little mini Lego mini figure with, it says bud on it. And, uh, you know, there just kind of little comic booky type stuff, which cool. is pretty cool. It's going downstairs in the in the cave. Nice, Ooh, nice. Thirteenth, you get anything particularly cool? I've been mad at Santa for very many many years because oh, I just the... can't be good enough to get Detective Twenty Seven. But hey, maybe yeah. next year. Yeah. Maybe maybe Detective Thirteen's more your kind of thing. I don't know. Well, Batman <laughs> wasn't in Detective Thirteen, so. Well, hey, it's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to go back in time and fix it. I think I think if you go not too far back, it was in Detective 13 with him in. Um, so <laughs> I visited my local comic book shop and following our, our one of our previous pods, and I know of uh, the professor's love of everything that is born. <laughs> there you go. Check this bad boy out. Look this at is, that. This is winning its way over to the professor. Excellent. Born, born number 35 in its uh, indie comic cartoon books infamy, black and white for you, just as predicted. So there you go. Well, that's on its, well, that's on its way. Thank you very much, Johnny. And I will I will say that I, I do have the omnibus. And when it comes to bone, size matters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, in, in a comic book, although Santa didn't give me what I wanted, I made my own Christmas and finally landed a copy of Strange Tales 178, significant because it's the Jim Starlin, Adam Warlock era, and I am a sucker for that cosmic stuff, the early ones. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sensing a trend coming on in a couple of episodes <laughs> at least. <laughs> uh -oh. We're getting there. Did you know that I've got? <laughs> <laughs> All right. This episode, though, we are talking everything that's a little bit alternative universe. Um, we've got three books to talk about. Um, the usual format, we're going to go through them, tell you how you can get them, tell you where you can get them from. And sort of like delve into this and see what we like. First up is the 13th choice. Let me just check my notes for this. This is, uh, let's say, What If number 24, volume one from December 1980. I have Googled to high heaven to find this book. And the only way I can find it is on, uh, in America, where it sells for around Fifty-seven pounds or seventy-eight dollars, depending on your uh, currency level. Really? <laughs> yeah. Crazy. That's surprising to me. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. So, so, what's so special about one of twenty-four? Well, as it's the thirteenth dream fetish stroke fantasy stroke, why is this happening in the real life? It's what if Gwen Stacy lived, written by Tony Isabella. Art from Gil Kane and Frank, I'm going to say Gia Garcia. I might have got that wrong. <laughs> it sounds all right. Uh, Colors by Gafford and letters by a very early Tom Ausichenko. I can't say Al Someone say that. Ausichowski. There you go. Thank you very much. Thirteenth. Uh, this was your. This is your pick. Take it away, dude. Yeah, there's a lot to cover here. Um, as far as the value. Um, you can find this book. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. Um, I, I, when we get back to normal, hopefully one of these days and conventions can start gathering again, um, I will see this particular issue. And if not, uh, most of the what if issue runs at conventions. You just got to be smart about it, though. And like to Johnny's point, it, it totally depends on the condition you want it in. No doubt about that. Um, but what makes this specific issue special 
is it has perhaps one of the greatest Marvel stories ever told, arguably. Definitely top 10, and especially in my book. And it has to deal with Peter Parker's first love interest in, well, first real love in Gwen Stacy. Jeb and, Whitman. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we know how the tale end, would end if this were her in this uh, predicament. Hey, now, now. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony Isabella, for those of you who don't know, he's the creator of Black Lightning. Here he is. Uh, in this uh, day in the life, uh, at one point in time, writing this particular tale. Before I dig into this, what if? I, what I find amazing in today's, by today's standards, it's I feel like almost every original what if volume one issue is a reality. It's just funny how creators go back to this run and pluck certain things from it and, and use it in the comic books of today. But back then, in, in 1980, this was a big deal. You know, Gwen Stacy was just a few years uh, removed from, from uh, continuity as it was. And people were left wondering, like, why? You know, Gwen Stacy from Amazing Spider-Man uh, 31 from her first appearance all the way through to 121 was a big deal for Spider-Man. Ironically, though, if you go back in, in the canon, Gwen Stacy wouldn't have more than a page or a few panels in each of those books. However, the significance of the character for the Spider-Man universe um, was cemented, and I think forever. So here we are, you know, in what really happened in Amazing 121. Obviously, Spider-Man, his greatest nemesis at the time, with the Green Goblin, learns his identity in Amazing 39 and always exploited that. And sooner or later, it felt like all of that was just going to culminate into what happened in issue 121 and 122. What makes What If so special is exactly that, a question, a two-word question, what if? And at that point in time, a lot of readers were left with like, how can you do this, Jerry Conway? How can you kill Gwen Stacy? Spider-Man, from, from probably the beginning through, through at least 122, was showing progression. He was a young kid, high school, went to college, met the girl of his dreams. She felt the same way. He was still Spider-Man. He was working. And most importantly, what a lot of people forget is the, they were planning to get married so one way or another. You know, Spider-Man had proposed to her. He, she knew it wasn't a secret. The, the, the families wanted it to happen. There was progression. And then it's gone. Now, what if, ask that simple question, what if Gwen Stacy had lived? Right? Obviously, yep. that would be different, very much different for, for Spider Man, as well as, and obviously, should be alive. Well, yeah, so, I, get, I get the idea, but you know, it's, 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 how far do you want to take this? It's like, what if she lived? What if this? What if that? What if she turned left instead of exactly? Going and you know, then how I, far do you want to take this along? Because I mean, this book doesn't particularly end well. Still, yeah, it, it, exactly. So, in true Spider-Man fashion, the question is asked, and you're right, Machine. How far do you take it? You know, it's what I love about the this issue, and particularly the run in general is how it starts. It gives you like the recap of what really happened in mm -hmm. canon. And then it decides to, presented by the Watcher, of course, uh, the greatest stalker of all time. Um, <laughs> the peeping Tom of the Marvel Universe. Yes. Yeah, so he, he says like, look, at this specific juncture, reality splits. So canon happens, but then there's an alternate path. So. I like that from back then, right? Because the, the multiverse did exist back then. Alternate realities, as they called them in Marvel or parallel dimensions or what have you, there was just a simple explanation. Like anything could happen and at a certain point in time. And they, they picked it up pretty much from the Goblin's encounter with Spider-Man. What, what I think it's funny is... Being a born and raised New Yorker, the, the first panels of in canon and in this book, mm -hmm. oh, it's a George Washington Bridge. No, it's not. It's the Brooklyn Bridge. If you see how it's drawn, either way. 
Um, you're like you're like my stepdaughter that yells at the start of Law and Order that the lights of the bridge are broken. It's I'm, like it's just a bridge, dude. Get over it. <laughs> I'm glad need, you mentioned I, that. I need something to kick this broad off. What can I find? Oh yeah, there's a bridge. I, I'm I'm glad Stop you mentioned going. that because I'm trying to relive how when I read this for the very first time, you know, and you you guys know me already when it comes to to the story of Gwen. I was like, I can't wait to read this. I have to know what would happen, right? So uh, with that being said, the famous encounter with Spider-Man and the Green Goblin, obviously had kidnapped Gwen, and probably one of the most iconic moments, unfortunately, for Gwen Stacy's life, she's knocked off the bridge. Now, in this yeah. what-if tale, Spider-Man actually saves her. And the first reaction I had to this, you idiot. Why didn't you do that the first time? <laughs> yep. Yeah, and but I loved how how uh, Tony is about uh, just carefully worded those panels in this in this what if book. Just that one quick iota of time where in canon he didn't think he just reacted. Where here he did, like almost in at light speed and just do dove after Gwen and saved her. Mm. And my only reaction was exactly that. You moron. You know, why didn't you do this the first time? Anyways. So as the tale would go on, you know, the danger wasn't over. Um, Spider-Man ultimately rescues Gwen Stacy. And what was true to her nature, which I think he did a great job in capturing, and same for uh, Gil Kane, whose art I love uh, from this era, I, I really think he did a great job of capturing Gwen's emotion here as if she's shocked. Like, so she's re she's thrown off her bridge. You know, she's gone through a traumatic experience. And just the way that she's looking at, at, at Peter, like, shocked. Like, you're Spider-Man. But I think the twist here, too, in a way, is how Spider-Man is somehow able to explain to her properly like a quick history of like, this is what happened to me. Here's this event. Um, your dad, who was very special to me, obviously very special to her, knew who I was. He died. So all that part from that was actual canon uh, is just quickly recapped in the first few pages with the exception of that he really saved her. Now, true to nature, Green Goblin, you know, uh, to kind of fast forward, always uh, was interested in taking over uh, crime in New York. Uh, the guy was just, uh, he had selective amnesia. So uh, <laughs> he, he selective amnesia, right? With the Peter Parker oh, identity, oh, wow. tried to use that to his advantage, but also try to take over the underworld. Um, his relationship with Harry, true to canon in this story, um, it was always chaotic, dysfunctional, but it, um, it, it's crazy that Peter Parker happens to be his best friend. Um, Harry's reaction to when his father tells him that Spider-Man's the enemy and also Peter Parker, his friend. Um, Harry stayed, in a way, I guess, kind of surprised would stay loyal to, to Peter Parker, at least initially in this story. Um, but ultimately, you know, as is true in, in Spider-Man lore, when, it, when something goes good, three bad things have to happen. You know? <laughs> and here... <laughs> He finally, finally gets what should have happened in canon, right? The chance to marry Gwen Stacy. Everything's going great. And then J. Jonah Jameson ruins it all by, uh, thanks to the Goblin, uh, leaking the secret identity info to J. Jonah Jameson. And he goes to town with that. And end of the story, you know, pretty much Peter Parker's a fugitive because that's how he was portrayed by the media then. What I do like, though, is... The, the touch of um, uh, Joe Robinson saying, you know what, Jonah? First of all, he, he, he punched him in the mouth, which is something I had always wanted to see happen. And then he just walked away and said, you know what? Screw you. I'm going to hit you where it hurts, and I'm going to do my own media empire and show the world what Spider-Man's all about. So Gwen lived. Goblin lived as a consequence of, of what happened. and But Spider-Man's life you know, took a turn for the worse. And uh, logic could dictate that Spider-Man would eventually find a way to 
get justice, who knows? It leaves you asking those kind of questions. But again, this is a what if, and I just think it's so amazing that decades later, there is a Gwen running around, although from an alternate universe in, in the form of Spider-Gwen and then others. Uh, the the Spider-Verse has just uh, really taken off with yeah. all these alternate versions of Spider-Man. But this is this one was where I could go back and say this was the genesis of, at least for me, yeah. of, man, that, that one question. And, and before I wrap this part up, ironically, like I said, I'm a born and raised New Yorker. I bought this comic book in Forest Hills, Queens. So for you Spider-Man fans who actually know what that is, that's where Spider-Man is from. So I felt it was fitting that when I had bought this book, I bought it in Forest Hills of all places. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> but, you know, again, the simple question, what if, and then you add this little thing behind it. And you, you're, you're, now we're sitting here decades later. That's a loaded question. Well, it really is. So my, my, so for me, I'm not, I am, I'm not being super jaded just for the sake of the argument, but Peter Parker is so much more interesting with Mary Jane than he ever was with Gwen for me, you know, but and I suppose you never get over your first love maybe, but for me, he's just a much better character. Somehow he's just, you know, Gwen's too perfect if anything, but as, as, uh, as I could attest with the professor, we, we spent one night over many a beer talking about Gwen. I'm glad you cleared that up there because I thought well, I didn't know where we were going with that. We're talking about born and spending one night. What's going on? Oh, well, no, no. This is a true story. We were talking. We, we had a, a long conversation of a lot of Marvel characters. And when Gwen came up, I, I just think that y you have to look at it from a lens from Amazing 31 through 121. Mary Jane is an absolutely significant character. There's no doubt about it. As many of the characters uh, in Peter's immediate circle. Yeah. But the, the way the lore was going, Gwen was the main, main, main character for him, was the main girlfriend. Mary Jane was, was somebody that he had met and had known, but mm -hmm. she wasn't anywhere near the, the tier that Gwen Stacy was at the time. Afterwards, once Gwen was out of the way, I hate to put it that way, then it op really opened up the door for Mary Jane. And as you can see at the end of issue 122 in canon, Mary Jane did actually one of the biggest actions she ever did without saying a word was just staying with Peter to console him. So that's, that's a legendary uh, comic book page. No doubt about that. Agreed. So professor, what ifs, did he work? Is it, I mean, I know, I know we're talking about Gwen Stacy. So, you know, um, 13th got his Gwen colored glasses on. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, when we when when you had this idea to, to do alternate universe books this week, that was like uh, when I was thinking Marvel. There's not really a lot of alternate universe stuff out there for Marvel in the timeline that we're kind of living in here, um, mm -hmm. other than What If, and you know, and then of course my my book that we're going to talk about. Um, but the the benefit of for the What If era here was um first of all it was an expanded uh package right you got like a 35 page book instead of a normal size book. right the what ifs were always more there was always more story right well you say make you say more story it's 14 pages to get to the point where it's divergent right so, but, uh, so but it's like 14 pages of stuff I, I already know for a collector like me who came in in the mid 80s where what if has already had already been published so some of these what if stories i actually read before i ever read the actual story right, right okay. so mm -hmm. that's this is one of those stories that i uh, that 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 i benefited from those first eight pages of exposition and or explanation of where we are in the story and um to me the, the the message for any what if story but this one in particular is be careful what you wish for right i mean yeah. because because what has happened in the in the beginning and in and, and 13 was was saying before uh people hated the fact that gwen stacy got killed off and they wanted her back and when this issue got released what if everybody was like oh Oh my God! They, they were going to bring Gwen Stacy back. What if? What if that happened? But as you read the story, you were like, "Oh man, maybe it is kind of a better situation for him that she's gone," and and that 
to me was to, to make me think that by the end of the story, I was like, man, I'm glad she's dead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, to me was, uh, was striking because I was like, kudos for Tony Isabella for making me think that, you know? Um, but that's a, it is a typical Peter Parker story, right? Where, like like you said, one thing goes right, three things have to go wrong. And it, that that's exactly what happened in this, but it, to the point where uh, it's, a, it's an ac actually believable story. If they kept going alive, this probably might have happened. Do you... Do you think then, because you raised an interesting point there, just as you, you can go there, do you think, without going into too much politics with this, that sometimes these stories, these what-ifs, are put out there with the editorial slant of, you know what, we've killed Gwen, we've killed the Phoenix, all right? So, really, we need to make it pal palatable, I can't say it, we, have, we need... Palatable. palatable? There you go, thank you. Palatable for the palatable. readers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Be a Jedi. <laughs> um, Do it. Do it. <laughs> um, so we've got to make it palatable for the readers to understand. So therefore, instead of having a what-if story where something goes right, let's have a what-if story which continues the trend of things going wrong. Even when what if Phoenix had lived, still doesn't have a happy ending. So, right. you know, these books, whilst they are a, a flight of fancy and a flight of imagination, surely they are just there to promote the idea that the guys, the creators, got it right the first time because otherwise this other bad stuff would have happened yeah it's, it's an interesting point you bring up machine and really uh, again this could have gone in any direction and to bud's point to piggyback on what he said could this have been trotted out there and become canon sure maybe modified a bit you know it, it depends who would have written it i, I would say and whatever they wanted to add to save jerry connery was given this like hey from editorial I'm sure he would have spun it a little differently, but yeah, would the fans have accepted it? Sure. Everybody lived at the end of this what if tale, right? Goblin was supposed to die, right? He didn't. Gwen was supposed to die. She didn't. Aunt May, again, like <laughs> as in canon, she was very, very old and sick, so she wouldn't have fainted and need to be hospitalized yet again. J. Jonah <laughs> Jameson went to like, he just became the ultimate, I don't know, dickhead in this book. Like, he went to another level. Uh, Joe Robertson, again, I, I don't want it to be lost. I just think that he stood out at the end of this book and said, look, you know, uh, George Stacy isn't around. I'll look after Gwen. Flash Thompson also was super loyal to, to Peter Parker, loved them both. You, you know what I mean? It, what was absent yeah. from here was actually Mary Jane and, and yeah. Harry Osborn. You don't see Mary Jane in this book. Oh, well, you can't so, have her in this. You can't have Mary Jane no. in this. That would, that would just defeat the whole point. The idea here, right. here was to, to showcase these two. The pro problem with what ifs for me, I know Tony Isabella did a really great, I know he's a really good writer, I know he's created loads of characters. I know that Gil Kane's a fantastic creator, but somewhere along the line, don't, I always feel the quality of these kind of falls flat against the main book. Whether it be the fact of having the pigeonhole crazy ideas in existing protocols or continuity or whatever i guess it kind of has to it, it yeah. kind of has to because it's not canon mm -hmm. it, it, i think this is like like we said earlier it's just it, it's a loaded question what if and and look at the discussion we're having it can really make you go in depth like what if you took the entire book and made a canon what if you took a couple of panels like to the watcher's point time diverged in one moment one iota of moment and, and it makes all the difference. And I think that's what makes this book and the run in general pretty much a masterpiece. And again, look at today's writers. A lot of writers will go back uh, to these particular books. What if the Phoenix have lived? Really? What if Gwen Stacy had not died? Really? What if Conan went to Manhattan? Are you kidding me? Uh -huh. Right? Like a lot of these what if actually has happened. What if Spider-Man was part of Fantastic Four? Uh, so <laughs> that's, that, that is, and that, that is definitely one of the things that makes me sad about going back and looking at these books is because almost every single what if idea in there has been translated into an actual Marvel universe story, uh, and then some. So right. when, when we're talking about, and that's why it was very difficult when we're talking about doing altered alternate universe stories and i was trying to think of marvel uh, you know i was like well what what do we have other than what if because they've made everything else mm -hmm. in canon <laughs> oh well 
on that note, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know whether we should take a break now or we, I tell you what, we're not. We'll go for it. We'll go for it now and we'll take a break after this. Well, we'll, we'll make it <laughs> quick. <laughs> All right. So I suggested an alternative universe because 13th came up with an Elseworlds story. And I was like, oh, if we do an Elseworld, the granddaddy is the one that I've picked. Um, then that, I said alternative universe, 13th went off on his fetish. Bud, Bud went a whole different way. Bud went <sighs> from May 1985 at a UK cost price of 10 whole English pounds, or around $13, I suppose. We have got <sighs> Peter Parker, the spectacular spider, Ham. <laughs> Number one. Written hey. by Steve Skeets, art by Mark Armstrong, inks by John, sorry, Joe Albello, letters by Rick Parker, and colours by Steve Miller. Yes, here we go, guys. It's Spider Pig time. Brought to you by the Looney Tunes <laughs> Meets Spider Man Brigade. Let me just bring up this copy for you so you can have a look at what we're talking about. There we go. Is that it? Is that the right that's one? A, that's there the one. There you go. That's the one. So, <laughs> look, I'm not going to tell you I love funny animal books, but <laughs> <laughs> look, uh, look, Marvel has a has a his history is steeped in funny animal stuff. Uh, you know, the first appearance of of a funny animal comic book was 1942 in Crazy Cat, which was a timely comic with Al Jaffe. You know, and then uh, later on down the down the the line, we have uh, you know Ziggy Pig and Silly Seal, which they tried to bring back last year. And you know, did you get something to smoke for Christmas? Is that why you picked this? <laughs> no, <laughs> I picked it to go up your ass sideways. But <laughs> but things like that. I, we could uh, we'll have Josh edit that out. But um. <laughs> No, I, the 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 thing that I like uh, about these funny animal books, especially, and uh, you know, I, I'm sure you 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 all read this for homework, uh, but Peter uh -huh. Porker, the spectacular Spider Ham, is really they play it kind of straight. Right? Yeah. I mean, you read it and it kind of reads like a Peter Parker Spider Man story with J. Jonah Jameson. And, and you know, it's kind of, it's yeah, kind of pretty yeah, straight, yeah. with the exception <laughs> of that all the characters are uh, funny animals. And there are a couple of, they, they do build up a couple of jokes. It's not filled with jokes no, the I'm entire not. time, it's not slapsticky at all <laughs> for the most part. Yeah. You have the Spider Ham and you have Dr. Doom. Those are the kind of, you know, funny kind of little things they throw in there. But for the most part, the the thing that I like that 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 you can do in a funny animal comic that comics don't generally do is satire. Yeah, they did satire, and, uh, and, and let's remember this came out in 1985, and Doctor Doom's big uh, big idea was he's going to create his own. Uh, rock band so he can win uh, so he can make music videos so this is very like an MTV era and he just wants to gain po power and become famous for uh, for creating a, 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 a rock band and what's funny is he kidnaps people puts electrical helmets on them and gives them shocks so they're just jumping around the stage and <laughs> the fans are all these alien kangaroos <laughs> That the <clears throat> how the reason apparently that the uh, the kangaroos uh, will clap and go wild for the band. That's gonna, that, that's that's you know. But I suppose uh, it goes well down under. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so th there are a couple of like built-in jokes here that kind of made me giggle in a kind of this is kind of sad kind of way, um, but. When I look at you know this book, general is going to be geared towards kids. Uh, first of all, it's very wordy. Just mm -hmm. look at that page, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's wordy, but the characters, you know, like I said, Peter Porker seems like Peter Parker. J. Jonah Jekyll seems like there you go. J. Jonah Jameson. Oh, get him in you know? 
<laughs> you know, and the, mm -hmm. like you're looking at this this page, you get the fantastic fur. You know, so those mm -hmm. are the, the those are the kind of groany type uh, little puns that you get in there. But I was I, I was intrigued by the the satire and how they could look at it and poke fun at what we were living through in 1985, which was MTV. And if you read future issues, I'm sure you only read the first one. But you know, other issues they talk, they they talk about other topical things, uh, tabloid magazines, stuff like that. Yeah. And for me, yeah. um, it was it was a a venue for them to kind of poke fun at what was going on in the eighties that generally you didn't see. Yeah. And and I enjoyed I enjoyed it for that. Um and but yeah, let's look. It's funny animals at the end of the day. So I don't expect uh, you know, our our regular listeners to probably enjoy that too much. But spectacular mm -hmm. spider ham or spider ham has a renaissance now and yeah. he's super popular in spider verse so uh you know he does have relevance even today <clears throat> okay so for me spider ham my first introduction to spider ham was as a backup story in the marvel tales uh reprint book yeah um so for those that don't know marvel tales very much like classic x-men was a reprint book in which you got um classic spider-man stories that were out of your pocket range basically out your wallet range so the be things like um the death of captain stacy gwen getting kicked off the bridge for real uh, and all these sort of things going on what was, was it was it marvel tales t-a-i-l-s t-a-l-e-s yeah sorry <laughs> and then uh, uh, um, sorry. <laughs> but there is a book that says marvel tales with more spider ham in um the difference between marvel tales and classic x-men is that Whilst Classic X-Men also had a backup story, there wasn't additional art thrown into the pages. It was just the original as is. So you got to see great stuff like John Romita and Gil Kane and all that sort of stuff going on. Um, for me, Spider-Ham has always been a bit of a laugh, a bit of a fun. Um, what well, You're absolutely right. From When I looked at this, the, the, the edginess to the art made me just take a little bit of a step back. Because I, looking at this, I expected cute and cuddly, like how he sort of like evolved into but yeah. it wasn't it isn't it is really quite edgy quite satire-esque definitely um the granddad jokes about the the animal names always make me laugh so i don't mind that so much um i think it's very much of its time and you're absolutely right spider ham's come back in a big way so yeah. hey <laughs> hey here what can you say 13th spider ham spider ham well, whatever a spider ham can thank goodness that Gwen wasn't in this first issue. What would her name be? What would what would Gwen's animal name be? There's a question. <clears throat> what if? No, what would it what would it be? What would Gwen? There's a yeah. there's a shout out for all the viewers. Get your answers in at o o l underscore book on Twitter, and you get a get a mention on the next pod. Give us Gwen Stacy's um, Peter Parker name, please. There you go. And then Dr. Doom made me laugh because, you know, years later in, in the later 80s, you know, you had DuckTales that took off. So mm -hmm. it brought me that memory. And then does Dodgy know if kangaroos actually like rock? We have to ask him. <laughs> we'll have to. We'll have to give him a <laughs> shout. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then the head apparatus that Bud was talking about, it, it's like, okay, it makes you bang your head. Oh, a headbanger. So I was like, well, that's cool. Yeah, and the MTV era, yeah, who who can forget? Um, I, I it's an interesting story. I, I think from the from the perspective of like you're absolutely right, Johnny, it does make you just take a pause and chillax for a bit. Mm -hmm. But it is kind of wordy. You st it's a first issue. I, I don't think anyone in their right mind back then said, Look, we're gonna have a smash number one hit comic book with Peter Porker. But here we are today, and his relevance is definitely there. And before this show, um, about three weeks ago, I had my hands on Peter Porker, number one. I do not own this book. I passed up on buying it. It was in excellent condition. But I'm like, well, let me think about it. If I come back to the shop and it's still there, it's meant to be. If it's not, and sure enough, it wasn't. Uh, it is in demand. What was the uh, retail on that? What, what, what were you looking at? Um, he was uh, selling it for about twenty-five bucks. Huh. 
and, but the condition was, uh, I'm not a professional grader by any means. I am a tough grader for my own books. But um, if, if I had to, you know, take a stab at it, I'd say it's an easy 9.5. Okay, cool. Easy, cool. easy. <clears throat> but, okay. uh, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's a tale from the 80s. And for, for some people, the, there is a fan base for this. And, um, if, and we all know that what's true is there is a fan base for nostalgia. And if this was something that you happened to pick up back then in the newsstand by chance, you just remember and you're like, yeah, let me, I'll get that. It's number one. Why not? And then if you're a Spider-Verse fan today, why wouldn't you have this? You know, you have the um, the Fantastic Fur in here, first appearance mm -hmm. in this universe. Doctor Doom, you know, <clears throat> obviously a parody of Doctor Doom. So if you're into first appearances, I think this one should be in your collection. And and I will admit here on the air, I made a mistake. I should have snatched that book right up with no question. So, Professor, next time you're on No Prize with Lucas, get him to run his... Uh speculation hat over this book will you please i uh, yeah no problem let us, know, at all. let us know what he thinks um right so whilst we kind of go and wipe our minds from this book that but uh, professor made us read <laughs> he's an advert for our other fantastic shows that you can get only on the ucpn let me ask you a question are you wanting to read a new comic book that has nothing to do with the big two are you tired of looking through countless titles and have no idea where to begin? Well, don't you worry because the random dude Josh and Johnny the Machine Hughes has the podcast for you. Flipside Focus, only on the Undercover Capes Podcast Network. All right, and for all you Flipside Focus fans, the next episode will be out probably in about a week after this one so there you go it's a little bit of shameless self-promotion there mr hughes hey i didn't write it man sorry <laughs> damn sorry. johnny pork you yeah yeah <laughs> all right so that was gonna be is it all right okay is that yeah. the, how the swearing works in peter porker universe <laughs> but, no, i think they talk about vegetarians and it just goes ballistic after that is it uh, that's what sheep said <laughs> <laughs> You better believe it. <laughs> well, the first song back here, look at that. House of Pain, did they get their song from here? Uh, Jump around? Yeah, they never know. Is this the book they bought, we don't have to ask them. Yeah, yeah. Let me just call them up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, damn it. Funnily enough, I did use that. Um, I've used that video track for, for a video of my cat playing with string. So there you go. There is, there is uh, symmetry in the universe after all. All right, okay, the last book, the last book from our alternative universe is probably the granddaddy of the Elseworld uh, universe, which was a DC thing back in the 80s. Uh, I'm not going to tell, I'm not gonna tell uh, any lies here, but this book was one of the books that got me back into this character massively, all right? I am talking about the fantastic... Gotham by Gaslight. Let me bring up a copy so you can have a look. Uh, boom, there you go. Gotham by Gaslight. Now, this is um, written by Brian Augustin, Augustine. Augustine. By, thank you. Depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, Michael Mignola. Not Mike Mignola. He was professional back then. Uh, inks by P. Craig Russell. Colors by David Homing. And letters by John Workman. Okay, this book, it's basically, for those of you who don't know this book, um, it's a Jack the Ripper story. Jack the Ripper meets Batman. Um, where should we go first? 13th. Talk to us about A Tale of the Batman Gotham by Gaslight. What did you think of this? Right off the bat, for those that are familiar with the title, but have seen the title and maybe never read it or whatever there's an animated cartoon out there nothing like the book yeah that's I'll a good shout. That right off the bat that, that's a great shout this isn't steampunk batman steampunk Correct. batman happens uh, in the cartoon and i'm not saying the cartoon's bad the cartoon's fantastic it's a really good read Agreed. and there's some really nice little touches to throw in there but if you're looking at gotham by gaslight the book thinking that you're going to get the the cock robins in there it's not going to happen i'm Correct. sorry all right there's no catwoman 
there's no Pamela Isley, right? So there's no Hugo Strange. There's no Robbins. Yeah. So he vastly, vastly different. Um, however, the the book right off the bat wastes no time, as in with many Batman tales, giving you the origin of how Batman came to be. Obviously, the death of his parents, the the, the most significant point in Bruce Wayne's life. Uh, what makes Elseworlds so much fun? It's like kind of like what we were saying with What If that moment in time in mm -hmm. in, in DC with Elseworlds. It's like we're taking our characters and putting them at any time. Yeah. And and I think that th th there's a big difference with that. And and to Johnny's point, right on the money, we, we take uh, one of the biggest mysteries of all time with Jack the Ripper. We take Batman, one of the greatest heroes ever in comic books. I said it. Um, and and we, we're going to just put him in that era. What yep. if Batman existed during the era of Jack the Ripper? And it, it's it's such a simple question. But the challenge here that the creators have is how do we make that work? And I think for for something so fresh back then, right, like Elseworlds, mm -hmm. right, you could be kind of take the ignorant around and say, oh, it's just DC's version of what if. It's different. It, it's, it really is an Elseworld, a different world where uh -huh. where where the elements might be, uh, some of the elements might be the same, like the darkness, the Batman, how he came to be, but the cast of characters, they're, they're careful in how, what they're doing in here. The, 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 uh, the language that they're using in here very much resembles back then. And if you pay attention very closely, for those of you who are into these real crime stories, there are elements in here in the art that pertain to actual pieces of the Jack the Ripper story. It would, there were so many suspects, and in the in the in the art in in the background art, you could see the names uh, of certain suspects that that no one knew who Jack the Ripper was. This mm -hmm. guy was out there killing women, and you know, but but who's the greatest detective ever in DC Lords Batman? Um, I I love where they started with Bruce Wayne's life as mm -hmm. an adult, being a student of Sigmund Freud. Yeah. And, um, you know, Freud is uh, interesting to say, uh, to, to, you know, it goes without saying what, what he's about. But I think that it already set up that element of the detective side of Batman. He has to know all angles, mm -hmm. including the psychological ones, the detective one. And I think that was uh, really, really good that they put that interaction at the beginning of the book. That's where I really got sold on this era. Mm -hmm. that Elseworlds was putting out there. But, you know, long story short, Jack the Ripper, obviously uh, a serial killer, uh, manages to get back to Gotham. Bruce becomes Batman at, at the same time in this version of Gotham, and he has to stop Jack the Ripper. I'm not going to spoil who the uh, Jack the Ripper was in this book because mm -hmm. I'm confident now with so many years removed from this book I, I feel like as time passes by, more people will pay attention to the animation than actually going back to reading the book. So mm -hmm. I can say for sure it is not like the cartoon. You might want to read the book. I actually enjoyed the book a hell of a – not to, to take anything away from the animation, but the book is a must-have. It's a must-have for your Batman collection. And to Johnny's point, it is the grandfather of the Elseworlds books. So Excellent book. Thank you. Good choice. Um, for me, I actually bought this book before I bought Year One, and you all know how much I love Year One. So mm -hmm. there you go, Professor. Batman taking on Jack the Ripper is that a does that interest you as a as a Marvelite? Yeah. So uh, and, and so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna juxtapose DC versus Marvel here for a minute because okay. I. I think this is something that DC does better than Marvel, and DC just. When they, uh, when they do an Elseworlds story, with when when you compare Marvel, anytime Marvel does something alternate universe, they still try to, uh, they try to still try to keep themselves within their own continuity, right? They still try to live within their own rules of their Marvel universe. We were talking about What If earlier. That that whole story or in that whole series really is just based on events that had already occurred in Marvel universe. Yeah. 
they don't when marvel doesn't take their characters pluck them out of existence and plop them into just a story like you would see in uh like say superman red sun or oh, yeah, or yeah. Uh, gotham by gaslight right that's mm -hmm. it's it's like a totally different set of circumstances you're just taking a bruce wayne and you're taking him out of here and over here and it's something that i think that dc's characters you know batman and superman specifically uh that you can just basically you can write anything and as long mm -hmm. as the story is good it's going to capture the readers and yeah. it's something that marvel's really kind of never been able to kind of get a handle on um but this is where i think uh, dc shines mm -hmm. and uh, you know i want to first i want to shout out I'm not a huge Mike Mignola fan, but this oh. book looks unbelievable. Agreed. I, you know, I, 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 I mean, you know, the Hellboy looks okay, but this, you know, Gotham by Gaslight. This is a beautiful book. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Storyline, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna confess here. I've never read Gotham by Gaslight until you picked it for this week's podcast, and okay. it's the story stands up. When you read that story, it's you're taking Batman out, you're plopping him in. It's the classic Jack the Ripper storyline, which is genius storyline because we never knew who Jack the Ripper was anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So now you have Batman on the case. So you're like, okay, this could, you know, I it was I was a totally believable story for me. I loved it, and I, I just loved the fact that you can really take Batman out of anywhere plop mm -hmm. him in anywhere and his origin still is kind of is the same you can explain it it's easy for you to buy into it you just mm -hmm. have to change his gadgets around right and make yeah. it kind of fit the story and yeah. uh to me it, it was it was a wonderful i loved it and uh, you know uh, yeah this is and like i said this is one of the reasons i love doing this podcast because i read stuff i wouldn't normally pick myself but you know you find some gems mm -hmm. some gems so for me um i totally agree with everything you're saying gotham by gaslight i'd never heard of mike mignola when i bought this book um i love him so much my wife bought me the hardback version of world of krypton which is completely different to this this has got style it's substance it's shadows it's the, the art just blows me away um I'm mindful because we don't want to give too much away from from the story. So I'm just trying to find some of the, you know, I mean, even bits like, um, let's see, this I quite like this page looks particularly. I mean, this is Batman. Look at him; he's chasing someone down. That could be anywhere. Look, he's these capes going it. What for? The guys running away. Um, yeah, Gotham by Gaslight. It's a it's a straight up detective story based around jack the ripper throwing the batman it's that simple it sounds it sounds simple when you think about it but in execution it absolutely I, is uh, i want to throw something out here too i agree yep. with a million percent with what bud said i'm not a a diehard my uh mignola fan but his art here fits to a t okay. and speaking of the artistic style right this book just showed us a different batman and, mm -hmm. and it, we take we fast forward to now how many different styles of bat uniforms have you seen this mm -hmm. was really the one that launched a victorian look for batman and it stuck and people love it to, to the point what you said earlier machine with the animation they took it to a whole nother level mm -hmm. but this is what started it all like yeah, you're like you know yeah the gadgets have to change but look at his look he had to he they sold it because they really put him in that era this is a, what he had available to him yeah, so there's that element of realism from that right. era. You know, it's not. I mean, Chris Nolan says he wants his Batman in the in the Dark Knight trilogy to be as realistic as possible. This is the realism. This is Victorian England. You all you've got. You all you've got is a, a, a big long coat for a cape. Uh, for a, a cape, you've got a horse for instead of a Batmobile. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's some stuff going on here. You've got daggers instead of batarangs, I suppose. You know, I mean the. the it's just well worked. It's a well thought out there. And the Batman on a like, horse is popular. Dark yeah. Knight Returns. And yeah. So, so you know, Johnny, answer something for me. Is this the first Elseworlds book? 
So yeah, this is the this is the book that launched the whole idea behind Elseworlds. It's not brand the original copy isn't branded as Elseworlds, it's just a tale of the Batman. This became so popular it then spawned the Elseworld ideas and where you get books like Speed and Bullets, uh, where you get things like <laughs> Superman Red Sun, which is fantastic for all those people who haven't uh, checked Red Sun out. The premise of the story is what if Clark Kent as a baby instead of lands landing in Kansas lands in um russia at the height of the cold war and what would happen speeding yeah. bullets was my first elseworlds book followed by in darkest night uh okay. speeding bullets is a what if superman was ba or batman was superman or yeah. vice versa but then in darkest night is what if the power ring found bruce wayne instead of hal jordan simple simple yeah. question but great yeah. books nonetheless and it's done it's done so well and for price wise this isn't out of anybody's pocket right price wise you're talking about 17.99 for a first print all right there are multiple copies of this you can get this book as a trade with its sequel master of the future right which is probably where the steampunk elements of the cartoon show come from if you're being ultimately honest but yeah um i think this book it showed what you can do and it showed that you can have um different batman story and Mignola, from this book on, I was sold. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I am a huge Mignola fan. Um, I love his work. I love his writing. I love how he's developed um, a writing style. I loved how he's developed the Mignola verse for Dark Horse. Um, you know, guy's got some talent, absolutely. And I used to love the classic X Men covers they used to do. Do you remember those, Bud? Agreed. The yes. Classic X Men covers with all the shadow, the one where the brood which is just Claremont's rip off of Alien. Um, particularly <laughs> scary. So, you know, so go and check them out. I'm sure there's, you know, classic X-Men books aren't going for a huge amount of prices right now. I want to throw something out there with this particular book too. The, appeal, the appeal of it, not just artistically, but story-wise. Mm -hmm. Back then, people loved self-contained stories. So still look at those, Yeah, <laughs> back then a lot more, right? Look at the, mm -hmm. the Gotham by Gaslight, the Speeding Bullets. In Darkest Night, these were we know the the, the canon side of it, but mm -hmm. they, when you buy these books, they, they were like pre, uh, prestige issues yep. or whatever, but self contained. So you're like, wow, I'm spending a little more, but I'm getting it all with this character. If they're gonna use it again, like yeah. Gotham by Gaslight, yep. it's it feel it has a sense of uniqueness to it because you've already been exposed to that version of Batman, that universe. It's simple, mm. but it works. I mean, I suppose one of the popular ones, and Batman works really well with this, um, the South World theory, I suppose, especially over well, Superman's pretty good, you know, but other other characters. Um, Red Rain. Yes. Where he becomes a vampire. Scary. Yep. Kelly Jones' artwork, Doug Munch, right? Brilliant. Yep. Great. Crimson so, Mist, the the uh, the sequel. sequel. Yeah. Yep. So go check them out. The problem with this idea of Elseworlds, World, so I'll say this, you know, I don't want to start end on an egg. But DC then took the matters to their own hands and then did a whole range of annuals a couple of years after the event. Mm -hmm. and absolutely killed the idea. So before you get those annuals and think, what the hell is the machine banging on about? Go back, get Gotham by Gaslight first, and then you'll see what we're talking about. There you go. Happy with that? Thrilled. <laughs> yeah, go get yourself a, a spider ham. Go to Gotham, buy Gaslight light it up, and then ponder <laughs> about how Gwen Stacy may have lived. What more would you want to do during the week whilst we wait for playoff football? Go to the kangaroo court Yay. with Dr. Dr. Doom. <laughs> Listen to Dr. some rock. Dr. 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 Doom. <laughs> J. Jonah Jackal. <laughs> 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 so would, would Bruce Wayne's name be, would, what would he be? Would he be Bruce Swine or something like that? Bruce, yeah, Bruce Swine. Dev, of Swain. course, that's yeah, exactly yeah. what he would be. Yeah, yeah. Bruce it would be Duck, Duck Grayson, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, there'll be homework. We'll have to come up with funny animal names for all of Batman's cast. Yeah. Oh, my God. Let's not do that homework. All right, guys. Thank you so much for spending the time with me. I know uh, it's an important time for at least two football teams that we support. Whatever. <sighs> yeah. Go winning paint. in, baby. Winning in. Just saying. Um, I have no confidence. <laughs> yeah. Do you drop in the zero zero tie. That's how you're going. In overtime. <laughs> I watched the first 13 seconds of the game and then hope for the best. 
We're gonna be if win, you, win, then go home for the Pats today. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think a zero-zero tie in overtime would probably give the Giants the the. The, the FC least. Should I watch yeah. the Dolphins game though? Because if they lose, I know I'm going to get a message of why did you watch the game? It's uh, obviously, watch, hey. yeah, it's bad you, luck, right? You, no, you're watching. Knock yourself out. Go for it. You heard it. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> all right. All the hair metal, metal Dolphin fans, send it to the 13th Crusader. That'd be great. Cheers, <laughs> um, we will be back in two weeks' time with another three books uh, where we're going to give it the old timers comic book show. Uh, rule of thumb over them and see how that goes um guys get in touch give us some ideas what do you want us to see do you want us to go back and talk about iron man do you want to see some cap america uh do you want to see some different characters we talk about get in touch let us know what you want you know we're more than happy to cast our eyes over anything the rule is however it has got to be at least no no later than what did we say 90 95? yeah tw- i think it's 25 years so nine yeah. like yeah so 95 or earlier and we're yeah. good um but that's so, what we want to we want to keep within the rules that we've established yeah so, so get in touch let us know what you want and we'll go for it and if you give us an image book well you might have to wait a while because they took some time getting out all right <laughs> at least back then <laughs> all right okay guys thanks very much for another great show Gentlemen, all the stuff for me that says don't forget to check out the new CPN uh, for all your favorite podcasts, including Bud, No Price Podcast, excellent, which is all about the Marvel, TDC, the Definitive Crusade, which is all about DC, and of course, you saw the ad earlier for Flipside Focus. All right, this is Joining Machine Hughes saying, See ya. Mm-hmm.